Our next speaker is Kevin Abosch, who is an internationally acclaimed artist. His work is driven by his interest in the nature of identity, value, and human currency. He works in photography, sculpture, installation, and film, and uh, his works have been exhibited in museums and civic spaces around the world. Uh, his most recent project involved tokenizing himself in the blockchain using his blood. Uh, and he's here today to talk uh, to us about his relation, the relationship between art, value, and material culture, and especially how we relate to art with no physical or even visual manifestation. Please welcome Kevin Ebosch. I, I, I won't be I won't be needing uh, I won't be needing the slides today because I'm talking about work that doesn't exist in physical space. You can't hold it, you can't touch it, so it would be silly to have some slides. Um, so yes, indeed, I work in photography, I work in, uh, in installation, film, uh, and, and most recently on, uh, on the blockchain. Um, uh, whether I photograph somebody's face or, or, I, or I photograph uh, an inanimate object or, or I have an oil barrel installed, I'm using these objects uh, uh, as proxies to distill emotions for uh, higher concepts that I'm, that I'm concerned with, which, uh, as was noted, uh, value, identity, uh, human currency, these are the the, uh, the themes that I, I tend to explore. Um, in 2016, uh, a photographic work I did of a, a potato uh, made news all over the world because it sold for a large sum of money. It was a, a million euros. So um, uh, understandably, uh, the art world didn't seem too, too fussed about that, but the general public uh, uh, w was, was taken aback. Uh, it, it, was, it was on TV, it was a question on who wants to be a millionaire, uh, the press secretary of the White House, uh, uh, brought it up on Good Morning America, a big talk show. Um, and if for a period of about, uh, it was certainly a year, possibly two years, uh, I found uh, myself, uh, well, receiving hundreds, if not thousands of emails a week, uh, saying nice things like, you know, congratulations, you, uh, you fucking hack, uh, you know, uh, and, 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 and uh, you know, any, any schmo can put a potato in front of a black backdrop and take a picture of it. Uh, you know, you should be put in jail. That amount of money could have bought enough potatoes to feel, feed half the world. And, all of that kind of stuff. Um, but it, it, and it was really fun to get these emails and sit, sit in my, my little secret island lair in Ireland and, 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 and laugh away at all this stuff. But, but over time, the, uh, the uh, attention went from the artistic value of my work to the, uh, uh, the monetary value, which is not ideal as an artist. Uh, as someone who, uh, you know, you worry about feeding your family, uh, you know, you don't lose too much sleep about it. But again, ideally, you'd rather the attention were on your, um, on your actual, uh, the artistic value of your work. Uh, so, uh, so I felt a bit commodified, and so l let's 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 take this back to uh, last December, going into January. I don't know how many people here are familiar with the concept of what's called an ICO, an initial coin offering. It's it's where companies are uh, essentially selling uh, selling these tokens, these crypto tokens on the blockchain, uh, to raise money for their companies, to uh, as 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 a, with a promise of future equity or some utility that uh, might be of value later on. And uh, because of my own interest in blockchain technology, n not cryptocurrency so much, but blockchain technology, I I, I was on the receiving end of, of these phone calls, uh, hey, Kevin, do you think I should do an ICO? And I'm like, well, you know, you were talking that you needed to raise half a million dollars for your company, and now you're talking about raising 30 million via an, an ICO. What are you going to do with all that extra money? I'm like, oh, yeah, point taken. You know? um, and so uh, I was very really down on this concept of the ICO. Uh, that said, uh, uh, after months, if not a few year, couple years there, feeling commodified, I thought, I want to I take control of this uh, this narrative myself, and if I'm going to be commodified, I'd, I'd sort of like to be part of that. Uh, but not, not in an effort to make money, just more in an effort to, again, kind of control and shape that narrative. So I, uh, I thought, well, what better way than to put myself on the blockchain in the form of a token? Uh, exactly the way these people are doing everywhere with these ICOs, but just from a different perspective. I didn't want to create a, 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 an exchange currency. I didn't want to create a utility token. Um, I wanted to just put myself into the blockchain. So how, how does one do that? How does one take themselves from the physical realm and put, realm and put themselves in the virtual realm? Uh, I, I, I did what I could. My, my wife is a doctor. I had my blood drawn. Uh, I created a smart contract on the Ethereum blockchain, and I created 10 million virtual tokens. Um, I called them Iama coins, and I wanted them uh, to be pieces of me. Uh, and so uh, the, the contract address, this four, 42 letters and numbers that's generated when you make the token, I made a rubber stamp, I took my blood, I imprinted that on paper. So I had these physical artworks, 
and I had the virtual artworks, 10 million of them. And by the way, those 10 million virtual artworks are divisible to 18 decimal places. So uh, what, just uh, having one token, uh, you could essentially distribute it to everybody in the world if you wanted to. Um, and, and another interesting thing uh, of, about, about this virtual artwork uh, is that uh, even the smallest sliver of it, the smallest fraction of it, uh, it, it has the same amount of artistic intrinsic value as a whole one, or even all 10 million of them. But uh, on the heels of an interview I did uh, on TV with CNN, uh, I, I found myself inundated with, uh, with uh, emails coming in from all over the world, from Silicon Valley, uh, and, I, and I'll attest to what Drew said, they do buy art in Silicon Valley, uh, and uh, in, in, uh, in uh, Qatar, and all over the world, people were, 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 were getting in touch saying, can I, can I get some of these pieces of you? Uh, sure, yeah, absolutely. I haven't really thought about how much they're going to cost. Uh, we'd like 100,000 of them. Whoa, 100,000. Like, uh, we'd like 10,000, 100,000. So I started to sort of feel commodified again in a way. Um, uh, and I, and, I, and uh, I, I actually didn't sell, uh, I sold some, but I didn't really address this, this huge market. But something was happening there. Something, uh, it was interesting that they were, they were potentially seeing this as some sort of investment. And people buy art for a multitude of reasons. People buy art because they like it and they want to dwell in the same space with it, they want to experience it, they buy it as a form of social proof or validation, and they also uh, buy it as an investment, which I've been told by the Security and Exchange Commission in, uh, in, in America not to talk about. I'm not supposed to say the word investment. Uh, I'm not supposed to say it on TV, and I say, well, I'm not talking about myself. Everybody knows people buy art sometimes as an investment. Don't say investment. Uh, and, uh, and I've been really, really quite warned about it. Like, I should not even be aware of that because uh, I could be complicit in some secondary market that might arise out of the selling of art. But as we know, you sell a piece of art, you don't know what happens to it afterwards. They can sell it, they can burn it, they can store it. Um, anyway, so uh, uh, this, uh, this led to uh, uh, me creating some, some derivative works uh, or off, offshoot, and off, offshoot works from, from this I Am A Coin project, uh, which included me uh, creating a blockchain uh, wallet uh, that I filled with 100 pieces of me. Uh, and I, on social media, I, I put the wallet address. I also put the private key underneath, and that private key basically gives anybody who has the uh, wherewithal to uh, enter it into their computer the ability to steal those contents. Um, I was aware, and I also put a, 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 a warning message on there that stealing the contents of this wallet is a crime. That was the name of the piece. Um, uh, I, I, it, they, they did end up leaving the wallet over a period of five days. It took five days for, for these pieces to uh, slowly leak out. Uh, in, in weird denominations like 6.66, and somebody would take some, somebody would put some back in, uh, but ultimately they were all gone. And I wasn't, I wasn't surprised or heartbroken, but a crime was committed. Clearly a crime was committed, uh, a, a, an art theft uh, of a great proportion, and, uh, and also a kidnapping, I would argue, since they were pieces of me. <laughs> Um, and so serious stuff we're dealing with. I didn't press charges. Well, that's the thing with the blockchain. I didn't know who to press charges on uh, because it's, uh, that's, the, that's the way it goes. Um, so uh, one of the interesting things is w with my work as an artist, I, I put work out. Uh, and if you like it, you like it, and if you don't, you don't. Um, I don't uh, but, but I don't usually take the feedback. There is feedback, like I said, you know, thousands and thousands of emails. That doesn't really inform my subsequent works. Uh, this work in particular, where I'm dealing with, with art that doesn't have a physical or even a visual component, uh, can, be, can be challenging. And uh, the feedback I'm getting uh, it teaches me a lot about people's relationships uh, with things they can't put on the wall or that they hold. When I was in Japan uh, dealing, uh, I, was, I was talking to a, a gentleman who was a Bitcoin billionaire. He made his fortune on Bitcoin. He made his fortune investing in something that you can't uh, see or, uh, or, uh, or touch. Uh, he couldn't understand how something that I had that he couldn't put on his wall or hold could have value. And when I'm confronted with that, my f sort of go-to thing is, well, you, you value love, don't you, right? Love you can't put on the wall, you can't hold. Uh, uh, and then if that doesn't work, uh, I, 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 then I just push back and say, I think you have a very unhealthy relationship with, uh, with uh, material things. Um, and, 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 and that concept is old. I mean, you know, we're all materialists and stuff, but it's, it's, a little, it's, it's, it's actually quite complicated. And the nature of how and why we ascribe value to anything is particularly interesting. Um, uh, we all buy things and you know, 
maybe nonsensical. I spent, well, here it's an expensive city, but I, I spent uh, $10 on a little kombucha uh, yesterday, um, the equivalent of $10. And uh, uh, I don't know if that was the, the, the best use of my, of my, of my money. Uh, and there is a difference between sort of value and, 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 and price. Uh, it's another discussion. But um, so this, this idea that people had this complicated relationship uh, with the immaterial led to some new work. Uh, and, a, and a journalist the other day asked me uh, something. They said, uh, you know, so what is it you're, you're trying to do? You're, you're, you say you're trying to uh, uh, kick off this discussion uh, uh, around how and why we uh, ascribe value to things. Um, well, conceptual art is already sort of challenging for a lot of people. Blockchain, to say the least, is challenging for a lot of people. And you put those two things together. Is this perhaps the best way to, uh, you know, to, to start a conversation? Maybe not, um, maybe not. But uh, but I think because of the, the crypto zeitgeist, uh, you know, that that's occurring all over the world, um, I, I am asked to, to to speak about this stuff, and uh, and I'm and I'm exploring it with uh, the people that are in, interacting with with my work. So the latest project uh, that I've embarked upon um, is a project called Priceless. Uh, I, uh, a fa famous artist named Ai Weiwei, uh, who is known for his uh, activism and his art and his uh, his work with refugees is a, is, a, is a friend of mine. We've collaborated before uh, in, uh, in the photographic realm. Um, and so we, we met in Berlin and we discussed uh, our, he's also interested in the nature of value, and we discussed our mutual feelings about this. Uh, and, and really what it comes down to is uh, the perversity of when somebody comes, when somebody's born, you know, you say that that boy, he's so full of potential, or that girl, she's worthless. And from the moment we're born, this, this value is being ascribed to us. And yet decisions are made all the time, all over the world, by individuals, by institutions, by governments, uh, that uh, seem to uh, devalue uh, individuals or groups of people. Uh, whether and 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 that, that that I think ties in very closely with the refugee crisis. Uh, I think if, uh, if 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 that group of people over there doesn't present enough real value or see, seem to present value, they get discounted, marginalized, potentially run out of town, and uh, in the worst case, murdered. Um, so we we thought uh, it, it, maybe uh, what we could do is uh, attempt as an exercise to make that. Uh, that relationship to the priceless a little bit more tangible. So human life, does everybody in here agree that human life is priceless? No? Nobody? <laughs> yes? Yes? <laughs> okay. Whew. I hope so. <laughs> so I was talking to the wrong crowd. Um, <laughs> The, uh, so, so, so if a human life is priceless, these, these little moments that make up human life are priceless. I mean, s these fleeting moments, this, these ban seemingly banal moments, every little one of them, this step over here, you know, which I, I'm going to forget about, you're going to forget about it, uh, that's priceless, it's all priceless. Um, so what we did is we embarked on, on tokenizing, again on the blockchain, uh, and uh, our, our shared priceless moments. So we just picked them out. I mean, randomly, whatever that means, but sort of randomly, you know, sharing tea. He, he, he said to me once, you, know, you have a big nose. And I said, well, yeah, I have a big nose. You have a big nose. There's another piece. You know, here's another walking on a carefree manner down Schoenazer Allee. That's another one. Um, talking about the art market. That's another one. We just pulled them out, a sampling of these shared uh, private, uh, priceless moments. And each moment uh, we, we, we represented by another 42 letters uh, and numbers, uh, blockchain wallet, uh, and then we had a, a, a crypto token uh, on the other side. So we had these physical artworks that were the numbers, the wallet addresses here, and then we had a crypto token. But this crypto token didn't have 10 million, uh, uh, it didn't have 10 million tokens, it had only two. But does it really matter when they're divisible to 18 decimal places? If I give you a hundred millionth of a token, you, can, you still have enough to distribute to easily to everybody on the planet. But people are funny. Not only do they have a complication with, uh, with, with the immaterial, but they have a, a, a complicated relationship with uh, fractions of immaterial things. So <laughs> if I say, uh, no, seriously, just right off the bat, would you like one of my immaterial things or would you like a hundred millionth of it? He wants one, right? Sure, it's a whole thing, but who really cares? Why? You think it has some more, in, more, more inherent value? I don't mean to pick on you, but does it have more inherent value just because it's a greater quantity? Um, I mean, we see it in the art world. We see, we see larger pieces uh, go for a lot more money 
uh, because they're great. Now, true, there might be a little bit more expense in canvas or oil or uh, oil paint, but uh, it, that we live in a society where more of something seems to be uh, worth, uh, worth more, uh, have more value than, 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 than a smaller amount. Um, and so uh, what we've done is we took uh, of these two tokens we made, one is unattainable, one is not available, it's priceless. And then the other one, we're just giving it away. And, and I, I would invite everybody here to uh, somehow contact me, and I'm happy to, if you have a wallet, uh, uh, you, or come up to me afterwards, and, I, and I'll send you a hundred millionth of this stuff, and that, which is power, that's enough to give to everybody. And now why, why is the question? I don't ask myself this too much, but journalists ask, so why the hell are you doing this? Um, well, it's again, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a way to keep in the, in the fore of the, uh, of the head uh, the, uh, this concept. I think we, always, we need to, uh, for ourselves, ask, ask uh, about our own value system. Uh, uh, and, and I have a friend uh, who, uh, it's, not a, it's not a nice story, he lost his toe. Uh, I, that's the punchline. But um, the <laughs> he, he, he was complaining for ages about, about an infected uh, toenail. Uh, and this guy's got money, by the way. <laughs> you know, like he's private doctors. It's not a problem for him to go to the doctor, throw a little you know, antibiotics on there, whatever, it's all sorted out. But no, he was worri worried about other stuff, making more money, I think, actually. Everything that he was busy doing was about making more money. Um, well, he lost his toe, that's the, pun that's the end of the story, is, uh, you know, he, he valued uh, having more money, he valued working towards some other goal more than his own toe. I mean, that, that's, that's, like, maybe, the, maybe toes do have a price, I don't know. Uh, but the value, I think the <laughs> toe is pretty priceless as well. And then even also the term priceless, I just want to sum up, you know, we talk about human life being priceless, we also talk about an ancient Egyptian artifact as being priceless, so I think there's even this hierarchy uh, w within the realm of pricelessness that needs to be addressed. Um, and that's about it. So this stuff that you can't see and that you can't hold, it may end up being uh, some of the most valuable uh, stuff you can uh, get your hands on, uh, or not. Uh, and uh, I welcome anybody here to, uh, to engage me later on, and uh, we'll figure out a way to get you uh, this thing that doesn't really exist. <laughs> That's it. Thanks.